Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercies, which are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, that you are the all-wise God, and your ways are so much higher than our ways and your thoughts than ours, and that your word goes forth and does not return void. The word of the Lord is not bound. So we just thank you and we ask you to loose your word, Lord, and bless it to every soul and every mind that's listening and refresh our spirits, Lord. Feed us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Good to see you again. Um, good to be with you again on our second uh, part in a four-week study on the authority of the Lord. And this week um, is a little bit different. And yeah, it almost sounds negative, but actually it's not. It really, it's just to help us understand that the Lord sometimes allows the enemy authority. And some of you may be, you know, eyebrow raised, wondering what am I talking about? Um, going right back to creation, we know at some stage, Lucifer, the devil, rebelled against God and apparently took a third of the angels with him. God didn't stop him. God allowed it to happen. The story in the Garden of Eden, the serpent came in and deceived the woman, deceived the man. God allowed it to happen. And so that's just a preface of what we're talking about today. Now, before we get into it, let me just say, because Liz said, I hope it has a happy ending. Let's keep in mind this whole study. Actually, the whole of our lives. Let's keep in mind that God is the all, supreme, loving God. God is for us, it says. Nothing can be against us. Well, that's half right in the sense that sometimes forces are against us. But what we need to read that verse by saying nothing can be against us in the ultimate plan and purposes of God. That's the thing. You know, we know that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And we know that when Paul says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. And nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. But when you're in that storm, when you're in those difficulties, let's be real. They are difficulties. There are tragedies that happen to God's people. Some are just as bad and evil as if you're not a child of God. Let's be real. Let's, let's you know, I'm sure all of us have got a testimony of things that we can look at and we just say, this is just, this was a disaster. This could well have been an attack from the devil. And uh, unless we know the whole counsel of God, and unless we know the whole plans and purposes and understand where is God in these times, some people will lose their faith and they will get shipwrecked in faith. The Lord said in the last days, the love of many, in the Greek, it's the love of most, will grow cold. And probably the best example, before we go into it, I'm going to go into it now. The best example is John the Baptist. John the Baptist. I told you the other day that he, he was a Southern Baptist, right? Because he baptized in the Southern part of the Jordan River. So he's a Southern Baptist. Anyway, my kids are going to hear that probably about a hundred times. But the point is, is John was the man who, with great faith, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then a little bit later, he's in prison. Okay? 
He's imprisoned by Herod Antipas. Where's God? Now John is at the mercy of this evil king, King Herod the Great Son. And John the Baptist is ready to get his head chopped off. And he's wondering, well, where is this Messiah who I saw and I believed and I proclaimed? And after all, this is the year of Jubilee when the prisoners get released and he came to set the captives free. So if he's the Messiah, he's going to do it. But he wasn't doing it. So John sent his disciples to ask, are you indeed the Messiah? And what did the Lord come back and say? Tell John, yes, I'm paraphrasing. Yes, I am the Messiah. I'm making the dead to rise. I'm opening the eyes of the blind, opening the ears of the deaf. These were all the messianic signs that the people were waiting for and expecting. He was doing all of that. So the message was clear. John, yes, I'm the Messiah. But John, here's, the, here's a, a Rima word for you. Because John, I know you're getting close to being offended here. And Jesus said, blessed are all they that are not offended in me. And this is what the Lord said, offenses will come. And when you're trusting God and all of a sudden evil or something negative happens, your faith is put to the test. And you wonder, Jesus, are you the Messiah? And you're hearing that he's opening the eyes of the blind the ears of the dead. He's doing it to other people, but he's not delivering me from my prison or my health or my finances or my relationship situation. And you can get offended. And the Lord said, if you trust me, there's a blessing. He said, blessed are all those who are not offended in me. That's one of the hardest tests in life. But the Lord promises there's a blessing there. Amen? So, guys, I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to go into depth, but I'm going to give five examples of cases where the Lord, in his authority, remember, in his authority, he allows the enemy to have authority over his people. Number one example is the most uh, earliest example is the story of Job, where the sons of uh, God came before this courtroom and Satan was there. And he begins to challenge the Lord. And what did the Lord do? He not only boasted about Job, but he actually said to the, the accuser, Satan, Satan, okay, he's in your hands. So number one example. Number two example is Zechariah chapter three. Once again, this courtroom place, Joshua, the high priest of the day, he's dressed in filthy garments. And who's standing right next to him and the angel? Satan accusing Joshua. All right. Number two example. Number three example, Luke 22. Jesus is talking about him extending his kingdom. And then he looks at Peter and he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, which I believe is a direct reference to the book of Job. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. And I've prayed that your faith does not fail. When you have returned, strengthen your brethren. He didn't say, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, and I'm not going to let him. I'm going to protect you. No, he didn't say that. He said, I'm going to be praying for you. Okay? And we know uh, Simon, Peter, was sifted as wheat. Number four example is 2 Corinthians 12, when Paul had these amazing revelations, spiritual revelations. And listen to what he says. 
He says, so in order for me not to boast, Paul knew himself and he knew that he had a problem with pride and boasting. He said, a messenger from Satan was given to me, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. What was that thorn in the flesh, everyone? I've heard all kinds of things. His eyes, his skin, his mother-in-law moved in with him. I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. But whatever it was, he says it was a messenger from Satan. And then he said, and I prayed to the Lord three times. And the Lord did not rebuke Satan like he did in Zechariah 3 when he said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Even the Lord rebuke you, even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem. No, he said to Paul, my grace is sufficient. Okay, that was Paul's testimony. And the last example, the fifth example, is when the Lord Jesus was at the baptism site. And what happened? He heard the heavens rent forth a voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Okay, so Jesus is on this incredible spiritual high. Can you imagine hearing the voice of your heavenly father audibly, audibly say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then what happens? It says Jesus was led by the spirit to be tempted by the devil. And he came under absolute demonic onslaught for 40 days and 40 nights. So they are those examples of the Lord allowing the enemy. And by the way, can I just say, and I didn't write this in my notes, friends, in the last days, we're going to see a massive onslaught where the beast, the false prophet, and the devil is going to be unleashed. We are going to see evil like we've never known it before and all the demonic stuff. So this is why it's good for us to equip ourselves, to prepare ourselves, and to see that God is greater and he is in control. Just because he allows the devil, allows the accuser authority, does not mean he's in control. We've got to lay hold of that truth that he is totally in control, totally in control. And let me just give you this testimony from a, a good friend of mine who's gone to be with the Lord. Okay, now this is a hard testimony to share and I, and I still at some time struggle with it now. He went to be with the Lord in a very premature way, a, a kind of a mysterious way, but his testimony, he was grossly, grossly abused as a little boy in every sense of the word abused. And you know what he said to me after many years of struggling and working through that? You know what he said? He said, Aaron, he said, the Lord must really love me to allow that to happen in my life. The Lord must have really loved me. And when I first heard him say that to me, I struggled. I almost, it almost, it, it almost sounded um, absurd or crude or in a way a little sick. But you know what? The more I've thought about it uh, with with the incredible manifold wisdom of God, God will never allow anything to happen without him being there as a great high priest to pray and the promises that 
all things are working for good to those that love God and who are called. Now, that doesn't mean all things are good. No. A lot of things are evil, but they are working together for good. Look at Joseph. Look at the evil that happened to poor Joseph at the hands of his brothers, at the hands of the Ishmaelites. Well, the Ishmaelites actually saved him. But you know what I mean. You know that story, Potiphar's wife, all of that. And, and, it, and it would seem that God was silent. And yet, what did Joseph say at the end? He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good and for the salvation of many. It's easy to say at the end, but when you're going through it, this is the difficult time. And so um, let's go back to our notes. And I want to just point out, uh, what do we do when we are experiencing these trials, when we feel that God is silent, when it seems like all hell is breaking loose? By the way, go back to the early church, everyone. The first few hundred years of the early church. Do you think it was easy for the early believers? No. Read Ro um, Hebrews chapter 11. What did, all their goods were confiscated. They were sawn in two. They, they were mocked. They walked around in sheepskins, in caves. This is the kind of lives that they lived. And I'm not talking for short periods. I'm talking for many, many years. Look at the Israelites in Egypt for 400 years. This is God's chosen people. Look at the story of Esther. When one evil man, Haman, rose up, where was God? Well, God was going to turn it around. Remember what I shared last week? That God, he allows things. He's going to turn around. He turns water into wine. He brings light out of darkness. So what do we do when we are faced with these trials? Or what do we, how do we counsel people who are facing these trials? And, and remember, the theme of our study is authority. The Lord's authority. Today, it's how sometimes he gives authority to the evil one. But it's also to equip us so that we have authority in the midst of these trials. That's why many Jews went to their deaths in the concentration camps by saying, Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They affirmed their faith. It didn't matter what the Nazis were doing. They affirmed their faith in the one true God. Well, firstly, I believe one key thing is that we need to know who we are. Are. We need to know. Jesus heard that voice from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. When he went out into that wilderness, do you think he felt like he was a loved son? Do you think that he felt that God was pleased with him when he was coming under that dry, barren, thirsty, uh, merciless, uh, unforgiving desert? Do you think he felt that way? No, he didn't feel that way. Do you think he felt God's love when he was on the cross dying for us? No, but this is where we don't go by our feelings. This is where we need the word of God. We need to stand on God's word and we need to quote God's word. No, God, all things are working together for good. God You've promised. What did Job say? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So we don't go by our feelings. We stand on those words and we know who we are. We are chosen. We are his children. We are his special treasure. And we've got to really, that's why in the epistle of John, he says, keep yourself in the love of God. Keep yourself in the love of God because the enemy 
will try to confuse us. It's because of sin. It's because, have you ever been through a trial where you, the devil plays with your mind? Well, it's because of this. You must have opened the door. And sometimes we do open the door. It's true. But what about the man born blind? Everyone thought it was because either he sinned or his parents. And what did Jesus say? No, no one. But, but this has happened. He was actually born that way, Jesus was saying, so that we can see the glory of God. So don't forget to know who you are. And this, this gives us authority. This is where we can stand and say, I don't care if all hell comes against me. I know who I am. So I want you to all turn off your, uh, turn on your, turn off your mutes. And I want everyone to give me an amen. All right. I need to hear that. Everyone. Amen. Amen. We all got to know who we are. Amen. Amen. Do I hear an amen in the house tonight? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. This morning. Ah, uh, yes, this morning. Okay, number two. Number two, and it, it, it's and a lot of these are going to uh, inter interact with each other. Number two is we got to know God's word. If we don't know God's word, we're going to be vulnerable, and we're going to always be on the defense. And that's one of our problems. We're always on the defense. No, God wants us to rise up and be on the attack. And we need to, we need to, you know, tell the devil, I don't care. I'm not afraid of you. God is bigger. God's got a plan. He's got my back. He may give you rain right now, uh, devil, but it doesn't matter. I, I may be being slayed. I may not be getting my prayers answered. John the Baptist, I might be in prison. I might get my head chopped off. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to... Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We, you know, God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, I'm not going to bow down. We need to know God's word so that when we're in these trials, we can thrust it back at the devil. Three times Jesus was attacked by the devil in the wilderness. And three times this was his weapon. It is written. It is written. It is written. So we got to know God's word. That's why I think it's important as a discipline, as a discipline to read God's word so that we have it in our minds we have it in our memory banks and by faith god the holy spirit or just simply our memories can draw on god's word in difficult times i'm sure many of us have got testimonies where we've come under attack and something came from the word or we've gone to the word or we've listened to a message and my gosh that word has just totally set us free. And then the circumstances, it doesn't matter because we, that God word, God's word pierces and it sets us free so that we can stand and we can, um, and it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. So that's number two point. We got to uh, know God's word. Number three is we've got to have our shields of faith. Always have our shields of faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith in Him, faith in His ways and in His Word and in the bigger picture. Faith that He is not only able to, but faith that He is working out all things. You know, it's one thing to... Uh, sit in a church when all things are easy, but then you get out into the desert, get out into the real world when all hell starts hitting us. And uh, that's when our faith is put to the test. But there's something else beside faith. And that's the fourth point. And that, and it's, and I think it's very different 
It's trust in God. See, there's one thing to have faith in God, meaning you believe who he is, you believe who he says he is, you believe he's all-powerful, you believe he's almighty. That's, that's faith. But what about trust? Now, this is something that I've struggled with big time. Trusting that this is actually in the hands of God. You know, when someone uh, falsely accuses you or when you lose your job, you know, you, you're tour guiding God. You know, you, you believe that God is still God, but hang on, God, I got no work. Or that person is lying about me. And, and, and when God is not doing anything, it, it's one thing to have faith in him, but when he's not doing anything, that's when you have to lift that or exercise that spiritual muscle of trust and say, God, I don't know why you're allowing this to happen. I don't know why you're giving rain to the enemy. I don't know why a brother, a sister, a trusted friend is acting like this against me. But I have got no choice. I've got to trust you in this. A good example is, is David. When David came under onslaught by King Saul, David didn't do anything wrong. In fact, he was doing the exact opposite, playing the harp, acting wise in the presence of Saul. And, it, and sometimes it worked, but other times it didn't work. And he had to run. And, you know, it, it's, it's a real challenge, trusting. Okay, God, I got to believe that you've got my back here. You're not answering my prayers the way I want. I got to trust you in this. You remember that old hymn, old Baptist hymn? I don't know. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. This is a tough one. But um, this is, these are the four key things that I've seen uh, when we are going through these trials. Deep, deep trials. And the Lord will allow his people. And I'm telling you what I've seen throughout history, what I've seen in the Bible... What I've experienced, when we, when we stand our ground and, and go through it, God will bring the glory. He will get the glory through it. Now, one of the things that God will, uh, will bring through it, or, or rather, and let me just check my notes here, uh, because I have lost mine. Yes, here we go. If you go actually, if you're following the notes, I, I, actually I've got this out of order, but let me explain some of the reasons why I believe God allows these trials. Okay, number one, and this is a little bit uncomfortable. Number one, it actually exposes who we are. You know, we can sit in church, we, we can put on the, uh, the, uh, the white uh, angel costume, right? With, we can put on the, the uh, what do you call it, the halo when we're in church. And then we get into the car and the horns start to grow and we get the pitchfork out because someone's just cut us off and our flesh rise up. And you know what I'm saying. I'm saying that sometimes these uh, trials and tribulations, they really expose things deep down in our hearts. And the great example that I've given is Simon Peter. Simon said, Lord, I will never deny you. And I believe a big part of Peter he really genuinely meant that. That was deep down in his heart. And we know that because when he was, the Lord was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, who was it that pulled out a sword? 
It was Peter. So there was a part of Peter that was ready to die, but there was another part of Peter that Peter didn't know about. And the Lord allowed this to happen. Remember what he said? Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. And Peter got sifted and he got exposed. And so this is not such a comfortable thing. And this is one of the reasons why, because it's to bring out deep things in our lives. So don't be put off if you're going through a situation. For example, this pandemic, this virus, that's exposing things in me. Anxiety, fear, you know, all kinds of deep, you know, and, and it's putting my faith and my trust in God to the test. Before it happened, it's like the story of Job. God said to Satan, uh, sorry, Satan said to God, you know, this guy, Job, he only, he only serves you because you've got a fence of protection around him. Take that fence away and we'll see what kind of a man he really is. And so God said, okay, he's in your hands. And that fence of protection is grace. When, when the heat gets turned up, that can expose deep things in our lives. You know, you, you, can, you can get into a, 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 a relationship, a marriage. You can go into a business relationship. Even with a believer, you can pray. You can think that it's totally 100% of the Lord. And then all of a sudden... It's like, oh my gosh, what did I sign up for? You know what they say, the things that I wish I'd known at the altar. You know? And uh, these things, th this exposes things in our lives. And Peter was exposed, number one. Number two, another thing that it exposes, these trials, it exposes who the devil is. We actually get to see who the enemy is. We get to see his ways. Paul says we are not unaware of the devil's schemes. Now, we, again, we should not at all be afraid of the enemy. If we know who we are, and if we know that God has our backs, even if we fail. You know, one thing I've experienced, do you know the boxing term, punching above his weight? It's basically, or, or when a, a tennis player is playing someone who's in a different league, okay? Well, the person who is less, that's one of the best ways that he can actually become a better tennis player. Or how a boxer becomes a better boxer, by punching above his weight. And if you look in Judges chapter 2 and 3, one of the reasons why the Lord did not drive out the enemies overnight, but he said one by one, is he said so that the beasts of the field don't come in. And it says to teach Israel to war. So one of the ways is this is how we learn to fight spiritual warfare. You know, there, I've never had a time in my life where I've been driven to prayer more than this season in my life. Uh, and it's through the anxiety and it's through the uncertainty. And, uh, and so, you know, in a way, it's a good thing because I am just, I, I would never have learned to be a, a, a fighter in prayer like I'm learning had it not been for the sense of uh, attack and the sense of warfare and, uh, and, and, you know, Lord, I need more of your grace. And when I don't have his grace, remember the point I made the other week? The Hebrew word for bread is lechem, from the word Beit lechem, Bethlehem, the house of bread, lechem. And the Hebrew word for a warrior is lochem. And it's from the same word. And when we're, when we're eating daily bread, Lechem, we become a lochem. We become a fighter. And as it says in Numbers chapter 13 or 14, it says, 
your enemies will be bread to you. We end up eating our enemies. But one thing is that we get to learn spiritual warfare. We get to learn the devices of the enemy, and he gets exposed. He gets exposed. Number three, so we've talked about exposing who we are, exposing who the enemy is, and exposing who God is. When we stand our ground, and even, friends, even when we fail, because when you're punching above your weight, no doubt you're going to get knocked down a few times. Peter denied the Lord. He got exposed, right? He was a total failure. And what happened? He went out probably thinking, that's the end. I have just screwed up my relationship with the Lord Jesus. And what happened? He went back fishing. And who took the initiative to restore the relationship? The Lord Jesus came to him. He restored him, beautifully restored him. So I think there's room for trial and error. And remember, this is a warfare. Don't you think that the Lord knows that we are no match for the enemy? And that's why the Lord said to Peter, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed that your faith does not fail. We learn more about God in these times. We learn that he is our great high priest. He's praying for us. How about that? It's, do you know what it feels like when someone says, I'm going to be praying for you, and you know that they're praying? So think about that. But think about how much more when you know that your high priest, the Lord Jesus, is interceding, praying. He intercedes and prays for us daily before the throne. And he prays that our faith does not fail. And we learn that he's faithful. We learn that God is faithful to us. Even when we do fail, we learn so much more uh, about God. And lastly, is what we learn in these trials. We, and this is really the, the summation of this message. This is one way that we get equipped uh, ourselves to be priests. We have to go through this school so that we know what it's like to fight the enemy. We know what it's like to go through these trials, these tribulations, these onslaughts. And like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we come out miraculously. We don't even smell of the flames and the fire because we have experienced that there's a fourth man in the fiery furnace with us. And, and, and we, we may go up and down. We may go through uh, trial and error. But when we come through the other end, you know, it's one thing to say, uh, um, you know, the Lord is my shepherd when we're in the green pastures. But what about when we go through the valley of the shadow of death? And when we get through to the other side, then we can say, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he is with me. We can't say it until we've gone through it. So we have a testimony. We have authority. And we can speak and encourage and help others who are going through the same trials. Young believers, older believers, people that have been believers for years, everything going fine, all of a sudden they have a, a, a relationship issue or a health issue. What about people that are facing serious health issues, facing death, you know, and, they've, and they know that there is eternal life. They know it in their head, but now they're facing it. And, and it's a different reality. Now they're sweating when they go to bed and they wake up each night. They're, they're, they're panicking. They've got this anxiety. And these, these trials are very real. And the enemy will do anything he can to rob us from our joy, 
rob us from our peace. He will lie. He will say things like, you know, if God is a God of love, he wouldn't allow this to happen to you. He loves you. He would never allow this to happen. Well, this is where we got to go to God's word. Look at Joseph. God loved Joseph. And look what he allowed to happen to Joseph. Look what he allowed to happen to Paul. Look what he allowed to happen to the whole of the Israelites under Haman. But friends, every story, Job, it in the end, it was better for Job. The Israelites came out of Egypt. They came out of bondage. They came into freedom. Joseph, he saw salvation. He saw restoration. Peter saw restoration. The Israelites, Esther, Mordecai, they saw the whole thing turn around after seeing God so silent for so many years. Friends, wherever you're, wherever you're at, whatever you're going through, know, let me just finish by going over, know who you are. You are a child of God. You are chosen. You are loved. Nothing can separate you from that love unless you let it, unless you let the devil lie to you, okay? But from God's point of view, nothing can separate you from his love. In fact, what does it say? For God so loved the whole world. God loves every Muslim, every Jew, every Catholic, every Buddhist. They just have not come into that knowledge and realization and revelation. But the fact is, he loves us and he's proved it by sending his son, Jesus, who faced the devil, who faced every onslaught from the devil. But it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And we've got to go through seasons sometimes of enduring and seeing the joy set before us. We will get the breakthrough. Know who we are. Know who the enemy is, but mostly know who God is and that he is, he, he's not the author of evil, but he is the Lord over all evil. So we need to proclaim this. Know who you are. Know God's word. Stand with the shield of faith and trust in God. Trust that he's, his ways are higher, his purposes are higher, and that when you come through, you're going to have a testimony. You're going, to be, uh, you're going to be a soldier more stronger, more powerful, and you're going to do damage to, to, to what the devil has done. See, it says in 1 John 4 that the devil is a liar from the beginning, for this reason, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. For him to destroy the works of the devil, he had to go into the devil's camp. And he fought him. And he came head to head with the devil. And what seemingly seemed to be a defeat, God raised him up on the third day. And he is in resurrection. And God will do the same to you. It may not look, it may not be resurrected the way we think and the way we want. You know, Joseph's story, he, he it, the, the situation was very, very different in his case. But it doesn't matter. God will, what was meant for evil, God will turn for good. Two last verses to finish on. James 4 Verse 8, it says this. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Notice the, the, the pattern. It doesn't say first resist the devil. The first thing it says, submit yourself to God. I know for years and years and years, I got it around the wrong way. I used to resist the devil first. And uh, a lot of the time, I didn't know who I was. 
A lot of the time I was doing it without first submitting to God in prayer, getting built up, going to the Lord in prayer, getting my daily bread, getting filled with the Spirit, having God's Word dwelling in us richly. This is what fills us with the Spirit. Once we're submitted in that way, we rise up with eagle's wings, then we can resist the devil in the power of the Spirit. Paul says in Romans, he says, when he's talking about the fight between the flesh and, uh, and the Spirit, he says, if we, by the Spirit, put to death the works of the flesh, we shall live. So we put to death the works of the flesh, by the Spirit. So submit ourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And then the last verse, Romans 14, 17, it says, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And once again, I've used that. There's a pattern there. First, there's righteousness, then there's peace, then there's joy. That's the kingdom of God. The first thing Paul says is we've got to be in that place of righteousness. We've got to have our shield of righteousness, our, our, our breastplate of righteousness. We got to be like in Zechariah chapter three, Satan was accusing uh, Joshua. And guess what? Satan was right. Joshua had dirty garments. When Peter was out weeping, I'm sure the devil had every right to accuse Peter. He's got every right to accuse you and I because we're all sinners. Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. But what we need to do, we need to submit to God, to his righteousness, which is the cross, the blood, which cleanses, which reconciles, which forgives. We are cleansed. We are clothed. We are clothed with the righteousness of God. So the kingdom of God is righteousness. Then the next thing Paul says is peace. We have peace with God. Romans 5.1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then comes the joy. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And when we get that joy, what does Nehemiah 8.10 says? The joy of the Lord is our strength. The devil wants to steal our joy. He'll go for our weakness. He'll go for something that we haven't got. Or, or just, you know what that is. But we've got to guard ourselves. And we've got to trust in the Lord and rise up and do some damage, and become priests, and take the authority of the Lord, and not be afraid of any negative thing. Remember what Smith Wigglesworth used to, remember his famous quote, where someone said, well, I think it's, I think it's an attack from the devil, and, and, and Smith Wigglesworth said, oh, is that all? It's the devil. <laughs> he could only do that from a place of strength. And if you're not there yet, press in, press into God, press into his word, learn, don't be worried if you keep getting knocked down, get some support, get some prayer support, you're going to overcome, we're promised to be more than overcomers uh, in, uh, in Christ Jesus, amen. Amen. I couldn't write fast enough. I could, this was um, unbelievable. It was wonderful and powerful. And I, 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 I have a lot to share from, from, from this lesson that I'll wait until I hear, you know, from the group. So if um, anyone has any comments or any uh, questions, please unmute yourselves or put it in to chat. Well, I'll start and um, 
where do I start? Okay, well, one scripture that came to me uh, when you were talking about um, knowing who we are and the trials that we go through, uh, it was 1 Peter 4, 13. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. Do not be on the defense. Rise up and be on the attack so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So it made me point out in my notes that when you had said, you know, the trials and tribulations uh, expose things in our heart. Well, I'm just reminded to deal with them right away. Press in right away. Find out what God is trying to do in this, you know, in this trial, if it's being disciplined or if it's learning, going from faith to faith, glory to glory, but get through it. You know, it's, it's like when you said submit to God first and get through this trial um, the, and get through the fire quickly and get to the lesson that um, he is trying to impart to us. And the, Sandra, do you want to interject here? Oh, Sandra was saying goodbye. Okay. Good night, Sandra. Sleep well. Yes, <laughs> um, and then you said, um, you know, the spiritual muscle of trust that we have to work that muscle and, um, and, 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 and believe how much he loves us. And I have felt recently in, in what the Lord has been doing in my heart, I thought that I really embraced his love. I know how much he loves me, but I wasn't really acting it out because if I had really believed in how much God loves me, then when situation occurs, a trial or whatever, there wouldn't be a wavering of my faith, which was another key point here. I can't rely on my faith. I have to have the faith of God. So when you say put on the shield of faith, I'm putting on his faith and who he is. And I think Susan uh, said something to that effect before um, about God, you know, his goodness always flows no matter the circumstance, he is faithful and true. So, you know, putting on the shield of faith to me means trusting in, in who he is and that he is faithful and that his word does not return void. Um, and the last point that I have here was, um, or that may have been the last point, yeah, so that's, that's what I wanted to share that, you know, is really, um, you know, exercising. Oh, and then there was one thing that I remember circling that do we give God total control? Like when you said God is greater, he is in control, but don't we take control away from him sometimes? <laughs> you know, like... That's what I'm trying not to do. <laughs> I want to get out of his way and let him be in total control. So I think for me, to get to where you want us to go with this and exercise the authority of God that is given to us in these days is to, as you say, trust in who he is exercise his faith, trust, you know, put on the faith of God and realize that when a trial does come, <clears throat> that the Lord allows it and, and, and expose the enemy right away and find out, submit and, and find out what it is that the Lord is trying to do in this trial so that we get through it and go from faith to faith, glory to glory. I may have mentioned this the last time, but a teaching that I was listening to recently by Henry Groover, <clears throat> who I love, and he's deceased now, 
uh, but you can see his teachings, uh, hear his teachings on YouTube or on his website. Um, he says when there's peace, when there's no trials, he, he asks God, okay, bring something on here, you know, like let's go so that I can go from faith to faith, glory to glory, and teach me. I want to go, I want to be stronger, I want to strengthen my inner man, but whatever. But that is um, a place that I would, I guess, I, like, I, I have to watch my words because God's hearing every word I say, but I would like to get to a place where I'm like, all right, Lord, bring on, bring on the trials, Lord. <laughs> ah! well, all right, well, thank you. That was... That what was comes a to me, Liz, yeah. is um, on one hand, if we, if we are like the parable of the sower, where the, the Lord gave that parable to show the different hearts of mankind, and if we had stony, rocky, thorny hearts and, um, you know, we're not dealing with it, then God may allow circumstances to arise to expose that in order for us to deal with it. That's one side. On the other hand, in the Lord's Prayer, the Lord actually told us to pray, you know, don't lead, uh, lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil. And so, um, you know, if, if, we can, if we can get to a place of maturity and consistency um, and, and we're keeping ourselves from idols and things that grip us and keep us away from the Lord, then, then I think it's okay to pray uh, the, 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 the other side, Lord, you know, keep us, um, keep us. And, and uh, you know, keep us from this evil hour that's coming upon the earth. Lord, uh, he, another thing he said, pray that you'll be found worthy. Um, in, in the last days, when the Lord is talking about the trials, the tribulations, um, you know, we're, we're going to really, we're going to have, we're, this is where our faith is really going to be put to the test. And and in a way we we we're we're tasting we're getting a taste of what of of things that are coming on the earth in in this generation you know with this virus, so yeah and you know one thing like you were saying and how how the enemy can come into our thoughts right and it just reminded me of something that I think I've, I've overcome pretty much I'm more, I'm I'm really thinking I'm I'm pretty much there. Um, with that said, um, we'll see when things go awry, you know, and, and I always then say like when there's that trial or something bad happens, I'll, I, I used to say, okay, am I not abiding? Did I go off track? Am I not in your will? You know, that's what the enemy used to do to me, but I really feel that, um, like something happened just the other day where it did not go according to my plans. It wasn't a big deal, but there was a plan and it didn't happen. And so the old self would have said, well, that's just great. You know, um, not, not what, that was not what we were supposed to do. That was not the plan. And now look, now you messed up these things and, and, and now, now what are we going to do? And, and, and it's a, such a simple thing, but, you know, just saying, okay, that's what, you know, to, to submit immediately. You said it, you know, submitting immediately and, um, and allowing God to work in this trial rather than you were saying, you know, you used to go to war first, which you would think, you know, but yeah, submitting to God, <clears throat> that is um, key, you know, right off the bat. Um, yeah, and then the, the statement from your um, friend that said, the Lord must really love me to allow this to happen to me, that, that went deep. That really went deep. And it was in a good way deep. 
you know? Um, and then I think that's what led me to first Peter four thirteen, so that we may be overjoyed, you know, that we can participate in the sufferings of Christ and rejoice in it so that his glory in it can be revealed. So when I didn't react, when the thing did not go according to schedule, it was better than the original plan, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I particularly like in the, in the Zoom chat what Susan had to say. <laughs> she said, dear Lord, so far, <laughs> I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent. <laughs> I'm really glad about that. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed. <laughs> uh, God, I'm gonna I, be I, had that, I, I had that hanging in my office <laughs> for years, actually, when I was working. But, you know, I have to say, you know, when you were talking about Romans 8.28, which is like one of my life verses, that he'll work all things together for good. I mean, I was, I was speaking in tongues while you were talking about that because, you know, God has proved his faithfulness to me through a lot of really long-term, uh, you know, I've learned what his long-suffering is like um, through my own long-suffering but at the same time, it's, it reminds me, you know, you, you said the fourth thing is that he equips us and makes us stronger. And it's really true because if we didn't have, I, I, I liken it to like um, weightlifting because the only way to gain muscle is to lift something or to put, exert some Resistance. kind of pressure on your muscles. And so if, if, the, if we never have to bear any of those weights, we can't grow and so it really you know god is faithful to not overburden us with what we can't deal with i mean his word even says that but at the same time you know even as you're going through it he just shows he's so faithful in the midst of everything and we can know when we're in his will when we have peace and so he helps us, he guides us, he leads us, and he shows us that, yeah, you may be going through this, but if you just stick with me, I'll give you peace throughout. You know, my, my favorite um, description of him is sleeping in the, in the back of the boat while the storms are raging. I was just typing that, Susan. That's amazing. And I, I, that's another personal thing for me. I've done a lot of boating in my life, and in the midst of storms, I've been able to have that peace. And so I, I understand and, and, you know, my life has been a lot of turmoil. Um, although he does take you into calmer waters after you've been through a lot of those trials, because he knows that you've, he's built up in you what you need to move forward into the next thing. And, and by the time you get to that next thing, you're ready for it because mm -hmm. he's just poured so much into you and allowed you to see. And like you were saying too, you know, he, he does, he, he shows us who we are in him yeah. through yeah. all of that, which yeah. is, I mean, every one of these points is so spot on. And, and then, you know, we also, you know, when he shows us who the enemy is, it's, it's awesome because then the next time the enemy comes in and says, I'm gonna do, you're like, you're like you know, right away. Oh, this is the enemy. You you recognize it. You see it, and you just sort of brush it aside and say, "No, not today, not yeah. today." You did that once or twice or five times, and I'm not I'm not putting up with it anymore. And so, he, he it's just amazing how he prepares you all along the way. But I mean, this was just this was awesome. I th I think one thing that really comes to me is which I didn't use this word. It's the word security, and when when the lord allows the enemy a certain access to his people and authority you know the lord is still on the throne he is so secure to do that and um that that's what amazes me psalm 2 where it says why do the nations rage 
Why do they plan? They plan a vain thing against the Lord and against the Lord's anointed. And then what does it say about the Lord? It says, he sits in the heavens and laughs. That's yeah. what it says about the Lord. He laughs at their plans. And when I think of how secure the Lord is, when all this evil, even against his own people, what an incredible revelation that is of who the Lord is. He is so secure. And when we can come to that place of resting in him, Psalm 46, you know, the nations rage, the mountains, are and then it says, be still and know that I am God. There is a stream whose rivers make glad the city of God. It's incredible in the midst of a storm when we can find that place of peace, kind of similar to what you were talking about, the storm on the boat. And there, what's, what's the Lord doing? He's asleep on the boat in that storm. Incredible. And on that boat story, <clears throat> I just would share that. I heard a teaching once from Nathan, maybe Morris, uh, Shake the Nations, and it was on um, Jesus Calms a Storm. And he said, like in Luke, it, it, it kind of stops after the disciples say, well, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. But it goes on. He said, don't stop there. Because the reason why there was an attack, the reason why there was a storm, because of what happened when they get to the other side, I'm really feeling the Holy Spirit on this. Um, because when, when he got to the other side, side um, they got their territory back from the enemy. Jesus restores a demon-possessed man. So on the other side of the storm, as Jackie, I think, was saying, um, to remember that there's really his glory will be revealed, you know, in the other if, when we get through the storm and and that and, and we will gain territory back from the enemy, which means a lot because the enemy has to restore up to seven times what he has stolen and return the years that the locusts and the canker worm have eaten. So it's through the storm, the other side, getting our territory back and God revealing his glory. Amen. Yeah, I, I, you know, listening to all of this, I am quickened in my heart to, to just share. Uh, you spoke about preparation uh, during your conversation, Aaron, and I've been going through soul care uh, for the last five weeks. And what's interesting is, you know, as we prepare ourselves for what's coming, uh, there are ways to do it. And I, I am so uh, blessed to have someone by my side who has encouraged me, encouraging me to do certain things. And uh, in soul care, uh, it, it, you go to a place and some of you have already participated in that. And I, I'm just endorsing this because uh, it helps us to get rid of the baggage that's in our lives. And if we're going to prepare for war, which we are already in, um, you know, it's like boot camp. You have to go to boot camp. And in boot camp, uh, they strengthen you, they discipline you, uh, they, they cut your hair so that you're all equal. And we're all in this battle ourselves. And we're not by ourselves. We're, God is with us and, and, and who could be against us, but we're, we're also in it with people that are like on this call and people that we pray with. Uh, but, but what God has been showing me in, in going through this, that there are things that uh, in our lives that many times we just bury. You know, we just, even though we may uh, repent and, and, and ask for forgiveness and forgive and whatever, there are some things within us that go back many years in my case um, that haven't really been properly dealt with. And, and, and uh, you know, we, we talk about submission. We got to come to that place where we are honest with ourselves, that we're able to look into the mirror and search our souls and our hearts for those things that have been in our lives. And it's hurts from people that we've been involved with, sins that we've participated in, uh, evil that maybe has been in our lives. 
because back in those days, we weren't prepared to deal with them as we are able to deal with them today because we're in Christ. And so, so th there are remnants, there are hanging things up that, that, that are like anchors that are holding us back from becoming the, the people that God has called us to be, to be, to be the, the special forces uh, uh, team that, that God is calling us into right now. And, you know, we got to unload the garbage. We got to unload those things that, have, that crop up that the Satan keeps, you know, attacking us, maybe even in our dreams and in our thoughts. And, and we say, gee, I wish I had done that. But God wants us to deal with those things. He wants us to unload the garbage so that we become the, the people that he has called us to be and to be able to, 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 to fight the fight against the enemy, but also to encourage one another and to speak truth into people's lives that speak things that need to be spoken um and and this is what what i'm getting um and and because it's all you know aaron you've been doing a terrific job i again commend you for for the teachings for opening up our our hearts and minds to 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 to, to teachings and things that we didn't maybe fully understand or comprehend and god is just building building us all up He's building, but he, but he wants us to get rid of the old junk. He wants us to, to surface it, and he wants us to just obliterate it with, with the grace and with the power that he is and the authority that he's given us to deal with all these things. So I just, I just share this with you from for my heart, and, and, and I just believe that, that God is bringing us to a place, and it's urgent. There's an urgency about all of this, and, and he, this is just not by accident what he's doing, and, and he's He's segregating us in a way so that we together will believe and we become a greater force. You know, when one puts a thousand to flight, two ten thousand. Imagine when we together really come to that place that we 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 have submitted and we have confessed, we've repented, and we've asked for forgiveness and we've healed old hurts and and we we unload those things that for so many years oftentimes have held us back from being the people that God has called us to be, to give us the full identity in Jesus Christ and have the mind of Christ and operate in all the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I just submit that to you. I, I saw almost 20 years ago now, my first ladies retreat that was acted out in, in live action. Um, a woman put a backpack on and they showed her going, she was meeting different people and she was offended by different people and she was insulted by different people. And each time she was insulted, they put a brick in her backpack. And by the end of her walk, and it was, you know, a few minutes, but it was speeded up. Uh, by the end of the walk, she couldn't stand up straight with the backpack because it was so heavy from all the bricks she was carrying. And, um, you know, basically the, the, mor the moral of the story was to lay your burdens before the Lord and give them to him and let him show you what they all are so that you can get rid of them and not carry them around. Because if you're carrying all of those things, you're too hindered to move forward or even to stand up to Thank the enemy you. because you're so overburdened. And Thank you. I just, I just wanted to add that because it was yeah. a real, a real picture, and I've never, obviously, twenty years later, I haven't forgotten that picture. And yeah. I try, you know, we need to try to so ask good. the Lord, what bricks am I carrying, and what do I need to get rid Thank of? Susan, that is, yeah. Amen. Amen, Susan. All right, our Haran, um, would you thank, first of all, thank you and bless you. Would you please close us in prayer? I know it's time. Amen, hallelujah. Lord, we thank you once again for this time. And um, Lord, uh, help us to digest this. Help us, Lord, um, to put it into practice, to be doers of your word and not just hearers only. And Lord, help us not to uh, look at the demons and even, even the demons that submit to you, but to rejoice that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Lord, thank you that we are more than conquerors. Thank you that you are supreme. You are the victor. And Lord, that, uh, yeah, this is a battle, but we are 
Um, we, we are co-workers with you trying to bring your kingdom and uh, your, your purposes on earth as it is in heaven, Lord. So I pray your blessing on everyone here, Lord, that we would be vessels for you, that we would rise up and know who we are in you, that we would know we would not be unaware of the devil's schemes, but that we would know who we are. We would know who you are, that greater are you who lives in us than, than the enemy who is in the world and who is sowing evil seeds in this world. Lord, help us to rise up and uh, with the shield of faith, with the breastplate of righteousness and with all the other parts of the armor of God. And Lord, where we see where the enemy has sowed uh, evil, Lord, may we be vessels of, uh, of or, or sowers of righteousness, sowers of truth, sowers of light and darkness, Lord. So I pray your blessing on everyone. Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmarecha, ya'e Adonai panav alecha v'yichonecha, yisa Adonai panav alecha v'yasim lecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the one who died, was buried, who risen, who is ascended, who is praying for us and who is, has the victor's crown. And we just say, worthy are you, Lord, worthy are you to receive honor, glory and all of our praise and all of our lives. In your name, we praise you and thank you. Amen. Amen. Shabbat shalom.